Welcome to the daily chapter reading of A Life Set Free, a true story about love and faithfulness of God by Rena Groot. YWAM. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. John 1 12. A group from YWAM, Youth with a Mission, presented skits and testimonies at our little chapter chapel in St. Albert. It was amazing. It w I was smitten. I had never seen anything quite like it, and I wanted to join YWAM more than anything I had ever wanted. John consented to go with YWAM for a year. I was ecstatic. I thought it was going to be as close to heaven on earth as you could get. I thought we, we, we would be with people who loved God and had a passion to make him known. We almost went in 1981. For some reason, God said no, or at least John thought he did. In 1984, after living in Chilliwack for a few years, God gave us the desire to take a year of our lives and pursue him by going to YWAM. He wanted to know him more and help others find him. YWAM has bases all over the world, so we had no idea where to apply. He, John had an interesting idea about how we were to determine the, where we were to go. He said we should pray about it for a month, and at the end of the month, we would write on a piece of paper where we believed God wanted us to go. I had the impression we were to go to Texas. Guess what John wrote on his paper? We had to check and see if there was a W. YWAM base in Texas. There was. It turned out to be the international base for North America. We decided to sell everything we had. We did not think we were coming back. If, if, if it were not for the wisdom of our pastor, Lorne Lueck, we would have nothing. He suggested, just on the off chance God had us come back to Chilliwack, we should keep some of our stuff. He, we sold our car, drums, Harman, Cardan, stereo system, and most of our furniture. The Luex kindly stored the rest of our stuff in their basement. Lauren said if we did not come back that they would have a garage sale, sale for us and send us the money. We spent the summer at Circle Square Ranch and then flew to Texas in the fall of 1984. David Wilkerson had sold Twin Oaks Ranch to YWAM for $1 for every 100 the property was worth. It was a beautiful place. The DTS, Discipleship Training School, was a blessing. We learned so much about the heart of God for the world. We were asked to read great books such as Reese Howell's Intercessor, Bruchko, Peace Child, and Lords of the Earth. They were such inspiring books. We had three months of classroom instruction and then about six weeks of outreach. The outreach options were printed on a corner of the chalkboard and we were given a month to pray about them to ask God to show us where he wanted us to go. The teams would then have a month to pray together, learn skits, and become a team. I informed the Lord that I was open to any option except the jungle of South Belize. I am not fond of snakes and scorpions. I advised the Lord that the North Belize team was my favorite option as they would be helping refugees. He was strangely silent. The night before we were to tell the leaders where we believed God wanted us to go, I still had no idea where God wanted us. I was lying in bed discussing this problem with God. I told him the next morning we must sign up for a team so he could... He, so could he please let me know where he wanted me? I waited. Finally, I heard him quietly say, Belize. I asked, north or south? And he said, south. I was in shock. I couldn't believe it. This was not what I had requested and was definitely not where I wanted to go. Why on earth would God send me to a jungle? The next morning, I asked John if he had an idea where we were supposed to go. What do you think he said? Yep, Belize. Are you surprised? When I asked north or south, you will never guess what he said. You guessed it. He said south. I felt like God and John were in a conspiracy against me. We drove night and day in an old school bus for five days from Garden Valley, Texas, through Mexico to get to Punta Gorda, Belize, in a rather old school bus. Two drivers shared the driving. John had the night shift. I sat with him all night to keep him awake. John and I attempted to sleep during the day on the suitcases in the back of the bus. John and I attempted to sleep during the day. It was a rude awakening when we hit bumps. One night in a small Mexican town, a policeman pulled us over. As he got on the bus, he looked at his watch and then announced it was illegal to drive a bus down the main street between the hours of 2 a. 2 and 4 a.m. Um, so, and so he arrested our bus. 
It was funny to watch the reactions of people as they woke in the morning to see a guard sitting by the bus on a park bench with a rifle across his lap watching us. <laughs> we were summoned into the police station. The police wanted to be paid because they said we broke the law. YWAM Texas was called. Pro providentially, someone in YWAM Texas had a friend in that town who happened to be a dignitary. A few phone calls later and we were no longer being charged for traffic violations, but we were being asked to pay the police for police protection. After all, a policeman had guarded us for hours through the night. He said it was dangerous place for us to be. A few phone calls later and we were on our way out of the town with a police escort for our safety. We dropped off the North Belize team and continued south. When we traveled as far south as you could go by land, we were informed we would have to go by boats to Bar Barranco. When we arrived at the dock, I wondered where the boats were. There were just a bunch of logs in the water. We were told the dugout logs were, uh, were our boats. That was a bit unnerving. We had to travel across the Gulf of Honduras in those logs. I reminded God I couldn't swim, but I told him I trusted him to keep us safe. Do you remember me telling you I loved exploring tide pools when I was a little girl? Barranco was breathtakingly beautiful. The beach reminded me of my beach I explored as a tiny girl. There were conch shells and myriads of interesting things to see. The huts were almost right on the beach. The men went off fishing in the mornings then spent the rest of the day resting on hammocks. The women worked from sunrise to sunset. There was no electricity nor running water so life there was very primitive. The majority of the people were children or elderly. Many of the 20 to 40 year olds had gone off to seek their fortunes in America. It seemed to me the children of Belize were mostly being raised by their grandparents. I visited the school one day. There were about 40 children with no books, no papers, no pencils. I did not really understand the purpose of them being there. John and I stayed in a lean-to that was part of the chief of the village, village's home. For the village, it was quite posh. There was a bed that had wooden slats and rolled up rags for a mattress. I praise God we brought a mosquito net. For some reason, Belizean mosquitoes ignored John but loved me. The room barely had space for a bed. There was no electricity, so we had to do a room inspection each night with a flashlight. One night, we discovered a massive spider trying to hide out in one corner. We knocked on the chief's door and asked if we could please borrow his big coffee can. It was his putty. In the mornings, we heard the shutters open and then the squawking of poor unsuspecting chickens as he threw the contents of his can out of the window on top of them. So, armed with the chief's pea can, John attempted to nab the spider. I had to follow the pursuit by flashlight. We hoped to catch the spider and release it outside the door. Uh, surprisingly, especially for John, his arm was almost immediately covered with masses of tiny baby spiders. Perhaps it was inappropriate to laugh, but the look on John's face was priceless. The chief assured us later John was in no danger. Bites from that spider could only have paralyzed his vocal cords and made him unable to speak for a few days. No biggie. One day there were no plans for the group, so I decided to follow a jungle path to where it led. I was armed with a matchet, machete, and high boots, so we could possibly go wrong. Someone had introduced tigers to the jungle. Why they thought that was a good idea is beyond me. Someone had intro um, Thankfully, this part of my story does not involve tigers or tommy goths, which are poisonous snakes so deadly that if you were bitten, you have about a minute to get your life right with God before you stand before him. I followed the path as it meandered through the jungle. It was incredibly beautiful. I am sure I was being led by the Holy Spirit because when I knocked on the door of the shack, a weak voice invited me in. When I opened the door, I was surprised to see no one in the room. The voice called again. There was a back room that could not be seen from the front of the house. A frail woman was lying on a bed. She looked like she was about to step into eternity at any moment. She had a huge greenish festering sore in her leg that appeared to be far beyond medical assistance. After greeting her, I could not think of anything to say other than, Are you ready to meet God? It seemed like the meeting was imminent, so there was no point of discussing anything else. The lady pointed to the ceiling to show me she was ready. Someone had placed a coffin in the open roof rafters above her head. It was so sad thinking the lady had to lie in bed and view her own coffin. She must have been full of fear. So we talked about spirit, being ready to meet God, and that dear lady prayed and asked Jesus to be her savior. You will meet that precious lady in heaven one day. 
This is a funny story. Belize used to be called British Honduras, and there were British military bases still in operation. Our mission groups met some British soldiers, shoulders, and somehow we were invited to the British Army base for di er, dinner. They must have been desperate for our company. After dinner, we were asked to share our skits. We had some icebreakers that were supposed to make people laugh. The soldiers stared at us with stony faces. It was a bis bit disconcerting. Gradually, the skits became more serious. The more serious our skits became, the more the soldiers laughed. When we presented a skit about what Jesus did for mankind, the soldiers almost fell off their chairs laughing. The commanding officer must have noticed our be bewildered expressions and ordered them to stop laughing. British humor is obviously very different from North American humor. A cool thing about our visit to that base is that a British doctor was able to cut the worms out of the bites of one of our team members. Don't you just love missionary stories? We spent about a week in Punta Gorda with a missionary family from Nicaragua. Mrs. Anderson went to the market and led dinner home on a leash. She boiled the iguana in coconut milk and said it was called Belizean chicken. <laughs> I did not want to offend my sweet hostess, so I ate some iguana and fried plantain. It was surprisingly delicious. <laughs> we also stayed at a YWAM base in Belmopan. That is when I really appreciated how amazingly easy life is in North America. I walked into the jungle to find a lemon tree and used a machete to get lemons for lemonade. At the end of our time in Belize, after about five weeks of adventures, we picked up the North Belize team and headed back to Texas. Do you remember how I, I wanted to join the North Belize team helping the refugees? I am so thankful God ignored my request and I obeyed his. That team spent six weeks digging out households. My recommendation is you listen to God. Do not insist on your own way. He wanted something far better for me. When we returned to the Texas base, all the teams shared about their outreaches. John was our spokesperson. He did a great job of making all the other teams jealous. Ours was by far the coolest outreach. After all the groups shared about their mission trips, we were told that we had to leave the base for six weeks until the school of evangelism began. We had nowhere to go. We had spent all our money to come to Texas and take YWAM's training for a year. We had no idea leaving the base for six years was on the agenda. Someone suggested to us that perhaps we could be guest helpers at Last Days Ministries. While John and I were sitting at a fast food restaurant, I was stressing about how we could contact Melody Green to ask about volunteering at Last Days Ministries for six weeks. John suggested I turn around. The back of Melody's head was nearly touching mine. She kindly said we were welcome to be guest helpers. What a blessing! While we were in YWAM, we were privileged to be in an amazing area of ministry in Garden Valley near Lindale, Texas. Keith and Melody started Last Days Ministry to equip the church in her final days. The Last Days newsletters were sent out all over the world and had teachings to encourage believers. David Wilkerson had a ministry just down the road from our YWAM base called World Challenge, helping drug addicts and alcoholics recover. David wrote a book about how, about how his ministry began called The Cross and the Switchblade. It was a popular book that was made into a movie. There were many musical groups in Garden Valley when we were there. Dallas Home and Praise, Silver Wind, Second Chapter of Acts, Last Days of Ministries, and Agape Force were groups that helped shape Christian music in the 80s. Keith and Melody Green produced beautiful music. Rick Crawford, Dallas Holmes' lead guitarist, was the worship leader at the house church we attended. It was an incredible blessing being in Garden Valley at that time. While we were at Last Days Ministries, Dan Cummings, our house church pastor, asked John to help him with a church he was overseeing. Dan preached at three churches every Sunday morning and was hoping John would help. John said he would love to, but God would have to provide a way for us to get there. We had gone to church every Sunday with our friends, the Mannies, but because the discipleship training school was over, they had gone back to North Dakota with their car. We prayed about God providing a vehicle. John helped in the automotive shop with Carlos, so he asked if he knew of anyone who had a car for sale. Carlos offered us his car for free. We asked him to pray about it for a week. What if he needed it? He prayed about it and a week later told us the car was ours. What? It was a Nova, Nova SS with an amazing Pioneer st st um, stereo system. The car had never been sold. 
A car salesman had given it to missionaries in California who gave it to Carlos. When we returned to Canada, we lived so close to our work we did not need it, so we gave it to Rhonda McClellan, who later gave it to the Vogues, who were missionaries to Paraguay. It is amazing remembering these stories of God's faithfulness. I hope you are being encouraged to trust that we have a faithful God. While at Last Days Ministries, we began going to Leonard Ravenhill's Friday night meetings. Leonard Ravenhill was an English evangelist and author whose main emphasis was on revival and prayer. He challenged people to follow Christ uncom uncompromisingly. People came by the busload from other states to hear him preach. He was an elderly, frail man who would slowly make his way to the podium. Once there, it seemed the fire of God would hit him and he became a powerhouse. Once he had stopped us singing, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing his praise and exclaimed, I thank God you don't have a thousand tongues. You can't even manage the one you have. He said there was more fashion than compassion in the church. You get the idea. His me messages made me repent every time I heard them. I asked Leonard a question about prayer after a meeting and I ended up being invited to visit him and his wife, M wife Martha for tea. John was also invited but declined. I think he was intimidated by this fiery passionate man of God. Leonard gave me a pile of amazing books about prayer and insisted I read them all. I'm sorry I did not ask him to autograph them. In March 1985, we drove our new car back to YWAM for the School of Evangelism, SOE. People wondered why God blessed us so much. We wondered too. The main teaching for our SOE was moral government, which was quite a controversial teaching that concerned us. Our outreach for the SOE was to Metro Assembly of God in the Ghetto in Brooklyn, New York City. Bill Wilson had a Sunday school of about 6,000 children. About 30 school buses went out on Saturdays and Sundays collecting kids from all over Brooklyn. There were over a thousand in attendance at each of the five meetings. The drivers had to be sure not to collect kids from different areas as there could be gang warfare on the buses. Seriously. The church was in an old brewery. There was a huge fence around the compound with reams of razor barbed wire on top of the fence. The week before we arrived, the church was being firebombed with Molotov cocktails. A huge Samoan with a sawed-off shotgun walked the rooftop every night to be sure no one caused any problems. It seemed like we had arrived in a war zone. Bill told us that all the female workers had been raped. The week after we left, someone left the pot the com the week after we left someone left the compound gate open one of the staff was working on his car in the compound and someone came in and kicked the jack over that held the car up the staff member was was crushed and died the Sunday schools were a one-hour, extremely high-energy program. The kids arrived to the sound of a band blasting out rock praise music. Break dancers danced in the aisles. There were contests and prizes. Bill presented a gospel message. The kids loved it. John, John coined the phrase Sidewalk Sunday School to describe the program we took to the streets. We had a minibus that was painted with stars. The windows had curtains in them so puppets could be used at the windows. We put cardboard down on the sidewalk so kids could sit. Before the program began, someone dressed in a yogi bear costume strolled through the streets with a megaphone inviting kids to come. He had a half-hour program that was always packed with kids and quite often very curious adults. It was a blast. John was the team leader. Everything went well until one day one of the team members asked if he could lead. I don't recall his name, so I'll call him Fred. He was the same fellow who wanted to hire a prostitute so he, he, we could witness to her. We should have known better. It was like God removed his hand of protection and showed us that it, what it was like without his covering. It was a nightmare. There was a kind of magic trick that was used near the beginning of the program where a handkerchief was turned into a cane. Fred was doing the trick and said, Eeny, meeny, miny, mo, catch an egg. We were horrified. Our audience was all black. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo, catch an egg. <gasps> to make matters worse, Fred threw the cane and it hit someone. Things started unraveling quickly. Someone climbed, climbed a tree and sat on a branch above us, spitting on us. Part of the program was a contest to see who could drink a Coke the fastest, a boy or a girl. The girl threw up. That was the last straw. 
People started yelling and asking if the whites had come there to make fun of them. John called a halt to the program and we made a hasty retreat before things got even nastier. One day, the YWAM team leader's wife took me aside and asked me to stop giving my lunches away to the children that stood by the back door. I told her they were hungry and needed the food more than I did. She forbade me to give away more of my food. God did something totally amazing then. There was a ministry in NYC that provided lunch for needy people. They had extras they didn't know what to do with, so they donated them to Metro Assembly of God. Bill Wilson asked us to hand them out. Isn't God cool? The fridge and kitchen counters were full of food to give away. I didn't say anything, but in my heart I was laughing and rejoicing at God's sense of humor. Bill asked John and I to stay and be part of his staff. He felt We felt honored to be asked. We prayed about it and agreed we would call the church back in Canada and see if they needed us. We decided that we would what we would be what based on decision on. I had taught in their Christian school, but my friend Margaret Bennett was teaching there while I was away. Christian school, when we called, I was quite surprised to hear that Margaret was pregnant again, and yes, they certainly did need us back. We planned to live in Chilliwack for one year and then go back to NYC and help Bill and Kyle Wilson. Bill said he wanted a life commitment. I thought the way things were going there that really was not going to be that long of a commitment. As we drove from Texas back to Chilliwack, we stopped by Circle Square Ranch in Halkirk, Alberta to say hello and show off our new car. They were delighted to see us. It was teen camp and they were short-staffed. We spent a week at the ranch and then moved into Larry and Lorraine Beliski's guest barn in Chilliwack, B.C. It was so much fun living by them. They often had missionaries over and we were invited to join them for visits and meals. Bill Wilson called quite often that year to encourage us about moving to NYC. Everything had changed before we heard Kyle and baby Billy had left Bill. He could not give his family one day a week to just be a family. That is all Kyle asked for and Bill had refused. He said he didn't have the vision. I could see the possibility of that easily happening with John. We made a final decision not to go to NYC after we went to Europe for the summer. When we came home expecting baby Sarah, we could not imagine bringing her up in the ghetto. God used YWAM to show me my focus should be on him, not on what I thought would be an amazing ministry.